Good morning, everybody. Thank you for zooming in today with us. On behalf of the Sandbox Center team, welcome to our Experts in Residence session, Marketing 101. Now, we know keeping your website full of content that is fresh, relatable, and engaging is a task that every marketer strives to constantly deliver. And throwing SEO rankings into the mix can be super daunting as well. So today, we're thrilled to have Daryl Wojtowicz, Sales Manager of NetGain SEO, join us to discuss how to rank in Google searches through strategic content creation and help you get noticed by Google. For over 12 years, NetGain has specialized in digital marketing in Barrie, and Daryl helps businesses attract new customers through powerful web marketing strategies. Before we get started, just a quick reminder to please use the Q&A feature that's just at the bottom of your screen there for any questions that you have throughout the session. We'll be monitoring this throughout, so if you have any questions that just come across your mind, simply pop it right in there and we'll get to answering as many as possible. Just wanted to thank all of our community partners for supporting with the sharing of our events. And of course, a huge shout out and thank you to our sponsor, NetGain SEO, for delivering today's session. So without further ado, let's get started. Daryl, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome, thanks so much for the warm welcome, Mackenzie. Appreciate it. And by the way, Mackenzie, you nailed the pronunciation of my last name, Whitewitz. Have you been practicing? I have. <laughs> okay, I figured as much. All right, so let me jump into this. Uh, my job for the next hour or so is to keep you enthralled. And if we're lucky, we might just learn something along the way. Uh, so let's, let's dive in. So uh, just a little um, further introduction about myself. Um, Whitewitz is how you pronounce it. I'm with NetGain. We are um, a digital marketing agency. Our office is located up on Bayfield Street. Um, we're full service digital marketing. And what does that mean? Well, it's everything from uh, web design, web development, uh, pay-per-click ads, social media management. And our job at the end of the day is to help our clients get found online. So I'm just delighted today to give you some free advice on things that you can do yourself to improve your, your website and your ranking. We've been doing this for about, oh gosh, you know, what? I think it's more like 11 years now. Uh, and our industry moves so fast. It's like, you know, it's like dog years. Uh, one year equals uh, you know, seven human years. So it feels like we're a 70 year old website company, if that's possible. And we are a certified Google partner, which pertains more to the pay-per-click ads, but uh, good to know that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're in good company here. So let's, you know, that's quite a mouthful, that, uh, that title. Uh, let's just unpack that for a moment. Website content that boosts Google rankings. Let's look at that first part, uh, website content. So most people will think of website content as one of three different things. Uh, it's, it's either uh, copywriting on the page, but it can also be images and pictures and photos, and it can be uh, videos. Like, you know, we're going to focus today on the copywriting or the, or the written uh, part of it, which I think is going to make uh, the biggest impact for you on your site and getting found. And the getting found, that brings us to the second part of that, that title, uh, which is the, the boosting. Oh, sorry, before I get there, um, written text. I just wanted to explain what that means. So if you, you probably sell a product or service, right? So that is a page. The written text would be whatever appears on that page describing all your wonderful products and wonderful services. But it could also be news articles. It could be lists or guides or white papers, um, you know, blogs, that, that kind of thing. So sorry, now I'll get to the, the boosting the Google rankings part. Uh, I could have rephrased this, I suppose. Um, it could be website content that attracts search engine traffic. It's all kind of the same thing. And what I'm trying to get at here is not just writing for the sake of writing, um, but it, it's helping your SEO. Um, SEO stands for search engine optimization, and it's usually regarded as, as, as technical work. But um, to me, the number one thing you can do from an SEO perspective, optimization uh, perspective is high quality content that will move the needle more than any any other thing um, there are about a hundred maybe 200 things that that you ought to be doing um, but let's start with with content I, which I think is the most important so the whole idea here is that when someone is looking someone that has never met you has no idea about your company but they're looking for your type of service or product is when they go into their search engine and and do a search inquiry we want to tip the odds in your favor that it's your website that comes up, not a competitor's. And that's what I'm referring to on, on boosting your Google rankings. So um, 
it's not all about copy. I think it's worthwhile taking a moment just trying to understand the way Google thinks. And I'm, I'm kind of anthropomorphizing Google a little bit. I think of it like a person. Uh, but Google is looking at a lot of different things. So it's not just the copy on your page. Uh, their, their primary focus is to match up whatever the person has typed into the search engine and see if that's a match for what you have written on your, your home page or one of your product pages or service page. So that's kind of criteria number one. So that if you're looking for um, like dog walking services, uh, Google's not going to return a result that has something to do with, you know, like a fence building company. It's going to be dog walking company, but there's lots of competitors in your industry, I'm sure, right? So you want your site to be up, not your competitors. But Google looks at a few other things, not just what's written on the page, but how people engage with the page. So for example, if you're ranked halfway down page one or heaven forbid page two or three, but people are clicking on your, um, uh, on your link, that's a good indication to Google that we've found the right match, that we've got a good relevance between the inquiry and, and what's on your page. So Google evaluates those page clicks. They also look at something called bounce rate, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but if 100% of your traffic is going to your page and then leaving immediately, uh, hitting the exit, that, that sends a signal to Google that maybe there's not that much interesting going on uh, on your site. Uh, it could well be that they've landed on your site, found your phone number and called you. That's great. Google will never know that, but it, 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 it evaluates that. Uh, dwell time. Um, if someone goes and clicks on your, your web page or your site, and they're there for 10 seconds and then leave, it doesn't say much for your site, does it? But if they hang around for 30 seconds, uh, a minute, a minute and a half, that sends a signal to Google that, hey, there's some interesting content on this page. Uh, and people are engaging with it and reading with it. And, and that last part, the, are they doing something? Are they clicking a button? Are they clicking other pages on your site? Are they downloading a, a white paper or doing those things that, or clicking on your contact form? Are they doing those things? So Google is evaluating all of that in addition to uh, the content. So my thinking is we better write pretty good content if we're going to get that uh, bounce rate down and page clicks up and dwell time up. So hopefully that explains the title of my webinar. It is pretty apparent to me that we need a strategy and that's what we're going to talk about today so that you're not just blindly writing and wasting your time or maybe doing some things that could inadvertently harm your site. So the reason I love this and I love having that strategy is it, I find it's doing this content writing. It's these are things you can do on your own and it doesn't, you don't have to pay anybody. I mean, you can, but you don't have to pay anyone. If you can write about your, your, your company in an informative way, it doesn't cost you a dime um, other than a couple hours to, to, to write a page. And to me, that second point there, uh, often overlooked by competitors, I will do web searches on just about, I mean, you name the industry. And when I look at the results, so maybe this is a silver lining for you. When I look at the results, I would say 80% of companies out there do a terrible job on uh, their content. And uh, they're ranking on first page, uh, maybe for reasons that are not related to the content. So to me, the bar is set, depending on your industry, the bar is set low. So that with a little bit of uh, strategic um, copywriting, uh, I think that we can get a little bit higher in those organic rankings and, and outrank some of those competitors that really don't deserve to be there. Uh, so I'm sure that your industry is, uh, is the same. So the three kind of areas we're going to focus on today is, is the anatomy of a high, you know, a high quality page, a high value page. If you're in an industry that services a, a geographic area, uh, we'll take a, we'll spend a, a few moments looking at a geographic strategy and we'll talk about whether, whether blogging uh, is worthwhile. So let's jump into the, um, the high quality pages. Research. God, no one told me there was going to be work involved. You're going to have to do a little bit of research, but I think we can make this fun. And we're going to call this keyword research. So let's explain what I mean by keyword. And let's also explain what kind of research you should be doing. So you may have heard of keywords or, or key phrases. Um, so it's not just a word related to your business, but all of you on the call today have a a collection of words that you want to be found when someone types them into a search engine. Um, so we're going to go over those. And there's something you may not have heard of as long tail keywords. And let me, you know what, let me just give you a couple examples here. It might illustrate what I'm talking about. So a keyword, a single word could be wallet. 
a key phrase might be men's wallet, women's wallet, leather wallet. I think that if you're in an industry that's super competitive, you may never rank for wallet. Or it's like if you're, if you're selling shoes and you're going up Nike, you're, you're never going to rank, but you might rank on what's called a long tail keyword. So it's some sort of unique thing that, that, that you have inherent in your service or product uh, that you can rank for that's not generic. So in this case, minimalist men's wallet with RFID blocker. That's those, those little, small, little, tiny wallets and they're, they're protected so people can't brush up against you and read your um, credit card um, uh, code. So that would be an example of a long tail keyword. And I think there's some great opportunities uh, for you to rank well. And we're seeing more and more long tail keywords. Uh, I, the reason being is less people are typing into their smartphones and more people are dictating or talking or doing a voice search. So the, the tendency on a voice search tends to be more of a long and rambling inquiry than just if you're typing out you know, men's wallet. Uh, so if you have a good handle on sort of the, the you know, the, the key uh, selling features of your product, then you can incorporate that into the, into your copy. And then you can dominate on those searches for um, long tail keywords or key phrases. But how do you know where to start? How do you know what keywords to use? Um, one, one piece of advice is just put yourself in the mindset of a customer. Uh, and we'll be uh, hitting on this a couple times today, but how would someone who's never used your service how would they search for you? They don't know your company exists. They've never had to use your type of service before. What kind of phrases would they like to use? So here's what I like to do. It all starts here. And I'm sure you've all done a Google search before, but there's something that you might've overlooked on a search. So um, while, while we're here, I'm just gonna take a quick, a quick detour, but you should be doing searches for your type of, of company. So if you are, if you're in the dog walking industry, you should be doing a, a search on dog walking. If you offer music lessons, you should be doing searches on music lessons. And you, if you see who comes up, click on those links of your competitors and find out what are they doing from a content perspective that you, that you should be doing. I certainly don't copy what they do, but you can use that as inspiration on content that you may be missing. But what I wanted to show you here is, so let's, let's do that search for whatever your product or whatever your service is. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, so you're scrolling past the ads, you're scrolling past the map stack, as we call it, you're scrolling past those 10 organic rankings. And then depending on your industry, there may even be ads below those organic ranks. So all the way at the bottom, Google gives you a handy little um, uh, bit of advice. And this is kind of what I'm talking about on the keyword uh, research. So Google says, so I did a search for staffing company. Um, and Google says, hey, here's some searches related to staff and company. And the reason that Google has suggested these is that people are actually using them. So this can be, a, you can mine this for, for keywords that you might not have thought about. So I did staff and company because that's just kind of what came to my mind. And they're suggesting, well, staffing agency or employment agency. And then they run out of things to say. So they're actually listing some, some, some actual companies uh, or staffing agency in Barrie. So if you're a staffing agency in Barrie, you should have that phrase, staffing agency in, in Barrie uh, and employment agency and use those types of things. So that, let's go on to another example here, which might help. I looked for swimming pool contractor in Barrie. So think of all the different ways that you could say this. Instead of contractor, you could say company. Um, that, that first one, pool builders. Um, make sure you've got that word pool builders or pool contractors, or pool company, or swimming pool company, or above ground, in ground. Um, there's one here that I like, um, pool maintenance, Barry. Well, if you're a swimming pool company or whatever your industry is, um, Google's telling you, people are searching for pool maintenance. And if you want to rank for anything kind of pool related, you should have mention of pool maintenance. And not just mention of maintenance, you should have a page uh, dedicated uh, to pool maintenance. Even if you're a company that sells the pools but doesn't do the maintenance, uh, you might attract those, those hits by having a, having a page related to that. I hope that makes sense. By the way, if anything doesn't make sense, um, please use that chat feature and um, send that off to Mackenzie so she can look through those questions. And I'll pause uh, throughout the presentation and we'll see if we can field some of those questions. No, no curveballs, please. All right. Here's another, this is the last example I'll show you in the, 
I did a search for phone systems for small business. So I'm, I'm pretending that I'm a, um, a, a phone system company. So Google's giving you some great phrases to use that people are actually searching for. And I, I, if I was a phone company, I would take this and make sure that I integrate it into my copywriting. So multi-line phone systems. Oh, I never would have thought of that, right? But apparently people search for multi-line or landline or best multi-line or VoIP system or virtual phone. I would never have thought virtual phone, but there's so many, um, there's so many great suggestions. Even having um, uh, the, the last one, the VoIP phone system for small business reviews. If you're, uh, if you're that kind of company and you're selling products, you can you know, give reviews on, the, on your, your suppliers. So having all of that integrated into your copies is a great starting point. So please use that feature. Again, scroll to the bottom of the, that Google search. It's on almost every single search that you'll ever do. Here is another handy dandy tool. It's called Google Trends. If you wanna find, it's a free, it's a free tool. Uh, just Google the term Google Trends and it'll show up. And I referred to, if you saw my last presentation, I referred to this. I'm going to use it in a slightly different way today uh, because after all, we're doing keyword research and thinking about what, you know, our collection of keywords is going to be before we just start madly writing. So uh, it's simple to use. Just type in a search term that is related to your industry. And there's some neat, uh, neat trends here, I think. So here's one, for example, if you're a dentist, let's say, I did a search, a side-by-side -side search for orthodontics and braces. Most dentists want to use the proper term and, and every industry has its own jargon. Not that orthodontics is jargon, but um, if you're a dentist and you have a whole page on orthodontics and, and you, all you talk about is orthodontics, uh, this is kind of a wake up call, right? Because look, this is actual um, searches that people are doing. So people are far more likely to search for the term braces because it's easier to say, easier to write than orthodontics. So I would adjust, if I was a dentist, I would adjust my copy. And I'm not saying don't use the word orthodontics, but I'm saying sprinkle in a little bit of both and you're more likely to, to uh, capture those searches. And this is neat for trends too, by the way, since I'm on, since I'm on this page, um, I just look at that precipitous drop right around when COVID hit, right? February, or beginning of March, guess what? No one was going to the dentist but uh, searches for braces, braces and orthodontics has gone above the baseline from 2019. So yeah, neat, neat trend line. I've got a couple more examples for you. So here's one from the legal industry, uh, family lawyer. You know, I, I don't know for sure, but I suspect family lawyers don't like being called divorce lawyers. Uh, maybe there's a negative connotation with divorce, but that's the common term is family lawyer. So if you've got, if you're a lawyer and you've got, you want to talk about all the great work you do for in family law, you would be remiss not to use the word you know, separation or, or divorce lawyer, even though you don't want to refer to yourself that way. But if you look at this, this tool, Google is telling you that divorce lawyer is a far more commonly searched um, key phrase than family lawyer. So suck it up and you know, sprinkle in some of that uh, divorce lawyer languaging, you are much more likely to get uh, search results if, if, you use, if you use those terms. Another, it's just uh, as an aside, because I love these trends so much, another precipitous drop when COVID hit, right? If you look at that end of February, beginning of March, and then I guess, unfortunately, um, people in quarantine for long periods of time, the, uh, there's been a, I shouldn't laugh, there's been a, a spike in searches for divorce lawyers. I should also be careful to clear my search history so my wife doesn't think I'm looking for a, I love you, dear, looking for a divorce lawyer. And my final example, physician and doctor. I don't know many doctors that have sites, so I won't spend much time on this. But again, just, just to illustrate a point, be careful about your industry jargon. Uh, people, don't use, people don't search for physicians. They search for doctors. So think about your industry. So just to kind of wrap up, and then maybe I'll just field a question, um, Mackenzie, if, if any have, have come through. For sure. Um, just be careful with your industry jargon. Every industry has it. Find words that mean the same thing and, and sprinkle them in. And just put yourself in the customer's shoes uh, is probably the best thing you can do in terms of getting that list of um, keywords together. Mackenzie, did any questions uh, trickle in? Yeah, so maybe if you could clarify a couple things here. So I know you mentioned um, 
to sprinkle in some of those keywords as best as you can. Um, I know somebody's asking when you integrate the phrase, is it okay to do it just once or does it have to be a lot of time? So when you say sprinkle it in, is there like a max of too ma many keywords? Yeah, when that is such an insightful question. And I think I've actually got a slide uh, devoted to that. Um, but since, since the, um, the viewer has asked, Yes, there is. You must be extremely careful. It's known as keyword stuffing, and we are going to talk about it, um, which is another reason when you want to talk about your products and services, you don't always want to be using that same word on the page. Uh, I look at a, a, the metric number is 3%. It's not a hard, fast rule. It's more of a guideline. But if you're writing a thousand words, um, and uh, again, I use that, a fence contractor. If you're in the fencing industry and you, you want to use that word fence, you better find another word uh, or another phrase. Uh, if you've got a thousand words, you, you would want to cap that at about 30 times. So by having those synonyms, uh, you can help reduce that um, the chance of keyword stuffing. So hopefully that makes sense. Perfect. Yeah. And then just a little more clarification. Somebody's asking, is there a specific way to choose your keyword or does Google just pull certain phrases from the page content and chooses what it thinks the keyword is on its own? Somebody's yeah. just asking for a little bit more clarification on yeah. that. Um, Google will read your page and interpret it the best way it thinks. And, and I use that word thinking like it's a person, right? But uh, uh, yeah, Google is the one to, to decide. Uh, best thing you can do is, is just to tip the odds in your favor by doing a careful job uh, and by being very clear. And I've got some tips throughout um, this presentation, which will help you structure your page so that uh, Google knows exactly what it is that you do and where you do it. Um, so yeah, so s please stay tuned. There's some more, more information coming. Perfect. So and then we have one last oh, question okay. one last. just right. regarding this. Sure. <laughs> um, what does the ad comparison function do? Oh, did we see that in a previous slide? I think we did. Ad comparison. Um, oh yeah. Um, so I've just used two terms, physician and doctor. Um, I could add another term here, MD or something, right? So it's just, you can compare multiple search terms. Perfect. So you can, you can do up to three. That's what that means. Excellent question. Awesome. So you start with one and then you can just, you can add as many as you like. Well, I'm sorry, you can add up to, up to three. Yeah, awesome. All right, I'll continue on. So now that you've done your research, and I don't want to say that the hard work is over because really the hard work is just beginning, but you have, you've done step one. You've collected all of the keywords. You've thought of all the synonyms. Uh, you, you've thought of other ways to say what it is that you've, you, you're doing. You're thinking of words, phrases, and you know, longer, uh, longer tail phrases. Now, how to put this together. Don't try to trick Google. It will not work. Don't pander to Google. In the back of your mind, yes, we're, we're pandering to Google. But really, if you take a focus on trying to answer your customer's question, then it's hard to go wrong. So again, put yourselves in the um, position of your customer. What could they possibly want to know about your, your products and services? Write in a natural tone, provide uh, excellent value to try to answer your customer's questions. And you really can't go wrong. So, so don't just, in the back of your mind, you, you want to impress Google, but don't write for Google. Uh, you will not be able to trick them, but just, just write a, a, a high quality informative page uh, in natural style and, and you can't go wrong. Now, I, this, well, this is the fun part, right? I get to pick apart some, some crappy web pages. Uh, and it's, it's informative too, because we know if we know what a bad page looks like, we can avoid it. So I've got three examples for you of what I consider a low quality page that I see all the time. I live and breathe this stuff. Every time we bring on a new client, I'm searching uh, they're through their competitors to see who's doing a good job and who's doing not such a good job and overwhelmingly 80% of the sites. So I'm on a crusade against you know, terrible sites, but I think it's a bit of a losing proposition. So let's take a look at some examples. So the wall of text and actually I spotted a swear word. So um, I apologize for that. Hopefully you can't see all the, uh, the words, but no one wants to see this. And what's going to happen. You could have a, a extremely well-written article, but if it's just a giant, Thing that people are going to visit this page. They're going to look at this, especially if they're on a smartphone and say, forget it, I'm out of here. And then Google is going to see that they, they visited and they stayed for three seconds and they left. That's bad news. 
don't do this. Most people don't err on the side of too much content. They err on the side of too little. Ah, so here's what I was referring to, and that was a, 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 an excellent question about that keyword stuffing. Don't do it. A uh, little cartoon here. I don't know if you can read. I'll, I'll, I'll just read it because it may be too small for you, but here's an example of keyword stuffing. Hey, Rosie, I'm going to lunch, so I'll catch you after I eat my lunch. I really enjoy eating lunch, so hopefully whatever I get for lunch will be really good. Lunch is really a favorite part of my day. There, there's nothing natural about the way that that character is speaking. Uh, so to, when you're writing, you, you, you don't want to do, you don't want to, to, to write in that style. You want to write in a natural style, and that is clearly anything but natural. So that person is looking for a way to insert that word, whatever that keyword is, um, kind of forcing it into the page. Don't do it that way. My final um, observation on what I consider a low quality page is what I refer to as thin content. And it's thin in a couple of ways. And I've got a, an actual example. I don't know if this company is on the call or not, but this is a real web page from a real law firm in Barrie. And I won't say which one, but th this is the page. You can imagine there's a a header and a footer, but other than that, this is it. And here's what makes it, in my mind, thin content. Two things. Number one, at the bottom, um, there's, there's, there's only like a paragraph, right? So you've got like 80 words, 90 words maybe. Google's looking for 400, 500, 600 words. So Google looks at this and shrugs its shoulders and says, well, you know, there's not, if someone's looking for a, a real estate, and this is a real estate lawyer, not a real estate company, but real estate law firm. So if someone's looking for a real estate lawyer, Google's going to look at this page and say, eh, I think I'm going to put these guys on page three. And so thin content is two things to me. It's, it's not enough content, but it's also, let, you know, let me read that first sentence. It, it's complete drivel. It's, listen to this, ownership and development of real property remain at the center of much commercial activity. It's completely meaningless. It offers no value. It's just... I don't know where they got this stuff, but guess what? This page is never, ever, ever going to rank. And even at the top, I, I have two red lines there. It says real estate. Really, it should say real estate lawyer. One step better is real estate lawyer in Barrie or whatever community that you're servicing. Um, that's a step in the right direction of getting this page to rank. So there's some examples of things to avoid. So, so go back. Don't do it now because we're on a webinar, but go back when we're done and look at you're with a critical eye, look at your own pages to see if you have thin content. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about what I consider to be a high quality page. Um, this is not one of our customers. I have never been there. I just, I was searching for a manicure pedicure in Barrie and this, uh, almost any kind of search related to that, this company shows up. So I'm like, and this is, these are the things you should be doing in your industry, doing searches and who shows up and why. So I wanted to find out what does this company do so well that they consistently rank page one, position one. And because I would imagine that there's a lot of day spas and like manicure, pedicure places in Barrie, right? It's got to be pretty competitive. Why do these guys always show up number one? So they're, they're doing a few things that I, I really like. Uh, number one is what I call niche messaging. So most companies just have services and they let just one page and here are all of our services these folks have taken a different approach they've they've gone here are our services and they've broken each one into a, a, a page so hands and feet facials massage waxing into each one of these has its own dedicated page with about 400 500 600 words uh, per page explaining everything about it uh, they're thorough they're informative like for example airbrush canning which i didn't even know was a thing not kidding um how, how could you possibly write a thousand words on airbrush tanning? And you may be asking yourself that same question on whatever your services are, but again, thinking like a customer, what is airbrush tanning? Paragraph. How does it, you know, how does the procedure work? Paragraph. How long does the procedure take? Paragraph. Is it safe? Paragraph. What chemicals are we using? Uh, paragraph. Do I need an appointment or can I come in on a walk-in basis? Paragraph. What celebrities are using airbrush tanning? But all of a sudden you've got, your thousand words or your 800 words or, or whatever it is that you're going for. And anyone looking for that specific topic uh, is going to find your page. And at the end of the day, you don't care what the point of entry to your website is. So if they end up on your eyelash extension page, as long as they book 
the appointment. That's all that you care about. So who cares that they're not going to your homepage? You want to tip the odds in your favor that they're just going to find your website organically. And by going to that level of detail, uh, it, it has worked for this company and I suspect it'll work for you. By the way, NetGain has the same approach. We have uh, in our world is digital marketing. So our services, we've broken up into separate, we've got a page for design, page for development, page for social media management, a page for copywriting. Yes, we do that. A page for um, pay-per-click advertising. Everything's broken up with uh, a ton of detail on each page and it works. Hope that makes sense. Just to hammer this point home on the word count, have you ever looked at a recipe online? I'm sure that you have. Do you ever get frustrated that you have to scroll down to this huge long page? You just got to scroll all the way to the bottom to actually get your recipe? Well, there's, there's a reason for that. These recipe companies um, are advertising driven. So they make money based on those, you know, the, the ads that are placed on those pages. So it is in their best interest to rank highly. And it's no surprise to me that the, you know, I did a search for jambalaya recipe, but it can be anything. It's no surprise to me that 4,000 words was at page one, position one. Next position down, 3,000 words, then 1,500. That is no accident. If, you know, all things being equal and take out all the other SEO technical things you need to do, the, 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 the page is so important. And then you start thinking, well, again, like how can I possibly write 4,000 words on a, on a recipe? Well, you're, you're not. You're talking about maybe a paragraph on the history of jambalaya or the way my grandma used to make um, jambalaya back in Louisiana when I was growing up or um, what substitutions, whether you should use jasmine rice or basmati rice, can you use a whole grain rice? Um, what's, what's a gluten-free uh, substitution? What's a vegan substitutions? And um, what to do with leftover? What, you, you can, if you get creative that way, you can easily hit your you know, 700, 800, 900 words. And clearly that strategy is working. And if you click through to any of these recipes, it is a high quality page. It's not just 4,000 words for the sake of being 4,000 words. So maybe there's a lesson, hopefully there's a lesson to be learned uh, from these folks. And perfect timing right before lunch. I'm gonna pause there again before I switch topics. Mackenzie, any new questions crop up? There are some new questions, but I might wait to the end. Sure, yeah, no worries. Uh, so, if you are a company that services a territory, uh, then this is super important to you. Uh, we're gonna talk about some, some ideas to help you rank in, in, in Barrie and in, in surrounding areas. Uh, if not, if you're selling across Canada, then you can maybe tune out for five minutes, but let's take a look at what I mean by this. Geographic strategy. So I'll use, again, I'm not trying to shamelessly self-promote, but I'll just use our website as an example and I'll show you another one in a moment. But guess what? We don't have 15 offices. We've got one office and that's located in Barrie. But it's important to NetGain that we rank in Gravenhurst and Alliston and Bradford and Keswick and all these other towns. So we've created a landing page specific to that town and all the great work we do for the customers in that city. This strategy works so well. So that if you're doing a search for SEO in Gravenhurst or web design in, in Keswick or, you know, it, chances are that net gain will show up on page one. Now it's a little easier for us because we're in an industry without borders being digital marketing. But it seems to me that if you are servicing a local area like Simcoe County or York region that you should be having those kinds of pages. So just by way of example, here is, actually this is a client of ours. This is a plumbing company. They've adopted the same approach. So they've only got one office and that's in Barrie, but they do a ton of work up in Muskoka. And they're like, well, Daryl, how can we rank better? Oh, here's an idea. You should have a, a Bracebridge page or a Gravenhurst page or a Muskoka page talking about all the work that you do and just letting, letting your customers know that you do service the area and also letting Google know that you service the area. So when someone's searching for, I've got a leaky pipe or a clogged drain in Gravenhurst, Google will have indexed that page and realize that, hey, you're a plumber that services the Gravenhurst area and we're going to rank, maybe not your home page, but this Gravenhurst page. And again, at the end of the day, you don't care what the point of entry is into your website. You just want that person to click through and then pick up the phone or submit a form request because they've got a, a leaky basement or whatever the case might be. So it's, it's a win for the customer and they get the job. 
and it's mission accomplished. And this strategy is so effective that they might even be outranking uh, plumbing companies that are physically located in these towns. So here's another example uh, that we met. I think this is, it's gotta be a, nat a national franchise. Um, so they would have a bunch of city pages for every city that they have a, a franchise location. So when I did a search for, I can't remember what my search was for, it might've been lawn control or lawn maintenance um, or weed control or lawn mowing. It, again, but by thinking of all the ways that a customer might, like, like me might search has never used this kind of service before, you wanna make sure you've got lawn mowing and lawn maintenance and weed control and all these things. But I ended up on their berry page, not their home page, but their berry page. But for all intents and purposes, the berry page is set up exactly like their home page. It talks all about their services. I just have to pick up the phone or, or submit a form. So this is very effective. I will caution you though, if, uh, if this geographic strategy pertains to you, there's some do's and don'ts here. You wanna be super careful about um, what we call content duplication. So what I mean by that is it's not sufficient just to take that word berry and then substitute the word Aurelia. That's not gonna work if the rest of the page is identical. So that, you see that opening line? They're pesky, stubborn, and seem to multiply every year. I, I assume that they're talking about weeds there. That sentence cannot be on your Aurelia page or your New Market page or your, your Midland page. Um, you've gotta come up with, so this, that, that makes it a bit more painful. You've gotta come up with a different way to convey the same idea. Um, Google doesn't issue a penalty per se for duplicate content, but it has the effect of diluting um, your content. So Google's looking at two pages that it thinks are identical, except for one word, the town name, and, and it doesn't know how to rank it. Um, so it, it has the effect of, of drawing down both pages. Uh, so just keep your content on a page by page basis unique if you're in this kind of an industry. All right. Our, our, almost our final topic, I guess, business blogging. Is it worth the effort? Should we be doing this? Is this a good idea? Is it a waste of time? I, I've got some thoughts on this and I'm gonna share them with you. So why would we do this? I got you know, three, three reasons and I've just got an example. Again, this is not a customer on the, the right side of the screen, but uh, I did notice they've done an excellent job. Look at that. Uh, and I, I did this screenshot a couple days ago, but they have already five posts in September, and it's probably up around six or seven by now. I don't necessarily think you need to be going on a weekly basis for your posts. You know, monthly ought to do the trick. But again, if you think like Google, and Google's got a choice to make. If you've got a site that's got fresh activity every month, and it shows that the lights are on in someone's home, versus another site, which is you know, otherwise identical, but it, you know, it's, it's moldy and musty and got cobwebs and hasn't been updated in three years, which site do you think Google is going to, to rank higher? Of course, it's gonna be the site with fresh content, but you're in a position where, well, you, you can only, re, if, you, if all your product pages are looking good, I mean, you can only rewrite your About Us page so many times before you run out of things to say. And that's where the blog is great. You can still convey new ideas and get fresh content and, and show Google and show your customers that, um, that, 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 that the lights are on in somebody's home. And it's worth noting that every single blog post that you put out, Google comes along and indexes it. And you can think of, they, you may have heard the term uh, like a, a Google bot or Google spider. They come along and crawl every page, meaning that they read every word on every page and it goes into their, their database. So if you're publishing and updating your site on a regular basis, Google will actually come more frequently to take a look at that site. If you haven't had any new updated content in a year and a half, guess what? Google's not gonna come by quite as often. Uh, to index your site. But every, every new page, every new blog article uh, in, uh, improves your domain authority, your page authority. And in the minds of a customer, just think about who would you rather deal with if you're going for real estate services or any service, right? Would you rather deal with a company that eats, lives, and breathes their industry or somebody with a one-page website? I mean, all things being equal, which they never are. You know, I would prefer to deal with a company that shows an interest in the products and services that they're selling, like this company does. Again, I don't know. I've never dealt with these folks, but um, they are doing an excellent job online. And uh, again, the great thing here is you don't have to spend a ton of money. Uh, you, you spend a couple hours, one evening next week, writing up a blog. 
and then getting that posted on your page. You can write a couple of them and then space them out uh, every month if you want to get all that writing over with. But I feel it's, uh, it's a great idea uh, and you, you ought to be doing it. So if you decide that you are going to do it, uh, I've got a few ideas. Again, that 500 words is kind of the magic number. Um, you may have seen 350 written out there. A thousand is better, I guess, if you've got something interesting to say, but uh, aiming for 500 will get Google's attention. Um, just make it, you want to avoid that wall of text effects that, that we talked about. I think about a newspaper. Do they still make newspapers? I think about a newspaper with, you know, little headlines and mini headlines and, and, and uh, bite-sized chunks and like easy to read. That's the kind of format you want. Maybe some pictures on those pages just to make it uh, uh, so that the user engages with it and Google will reward you for that. The last bullet point I have there is about linking opportunity. And what I mean there is it's, it's called the World Wide Web for a reason. Uh, you want to be linking to other pages and other websites and you want hopefully those other websites are linking back to you. Uh, you don't want to have a blog article or any page out there as an orphan page or an island in the middle of an ocean. You want to connect it to other pages. So if you're doing a blog article on whatever your topic is, um, you, if it pertains to something else on your website, make sure you link back over to that other page that it you know, pertains to. So if you do maybe two or three internal links to other pages on your website, if it's, if it's relevant, and maybe think about doing one or two uh, outbound links. It doesn't really benefit you, but uh, directly, except it helps Google contextualize your, your information. So if you're linking to a relevant site that has something to do with your industry, Google says, oh yeah, I get it. it this is what they're doing and this is how it's all related. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good idea instead of just throwing up a, you know, like a, a crappy 50 word blog, you know, take the time to, to do it properly. And that last bullet is one that people always seem to forget, but it's important. All right, you still with me? What are our next steps? Now that you've written a blog, you want to let people know about it, right? And if you're uh, uh, doing any sort of social media, you're, you're probably banging your head against the wall and, and starved for something to say because it's hard to come up with ideas, right? Well, just by virtue that you have a new blog article, you, you let the world know about it. It's a great opportunity to, um, to post on social media, especially if you're looking for things to say. Just say, hey, we, we've, I've got a great new article on this. Or, you know, winter's coming and here's some things that you should be thinking of uh, pertaining to your industry. And Another thing to think about is Google is watching all of this. So if Google sees a bunch of traffic, so you, you write a blog, you post it on Facebook, and then you get traffic directed back to your website. So if Google sees traffic coming from Facebook or LinkedIn or Pinterest or, or, or whatever social media outlets that you're using, Google thinks to itself, wow, there must be something interesting going on here if 32 people have visited this website through, through Twitter or, or, or Instagram. Google watches all of that stuff. So it's a great way to promote your, uh, your blogs and get traffic and get deals and leads and rank better. Now, how to prioritize some of those things I've been talking about. Don't, don't rush out and write a blog this afternoon if the rest of your website needs work. Focus on your cornerstone content. That's those product pages that I talked about. That's the, the service pages that I talked about. You're, you're about us. So all those important pages uh, about your company and about your, your offerings. Get those into shape first. Then if you're in an industry that services a specific area or territory, uh, think about doing those geographic pages. I would put, you know, once everything is the way you want it, I prioritize the blogs is that, that third thing you can work on. But once you start on the blogs, there's, there's not a real compelling reason to go back. I mean, every once in a while you will, but you don't really need to revisit those other pages near as frequently. Ah, I got some technical stuff here. Uh, before I do, uh, Mackenzie, was there anything, any questions that we want to answer before I kind of switch gears? Um, there are a couple of questions here. Um, how can I make sure that I'm seeing the search results that a first time or neutral searcher would see? So that my yes. search history or Google's knowledge of me or my location does not influence the results. Yeah, super good question. Um, I use um, Google Chrome as my, 
my web browser. Uh, but regardless of what you're using, you want to do a, uh, like a hidden or Google calls it an incognito search. Um, that clears out your history, clears out your cookies, clears out your cache. So it's a good way to approximate a new user. So it's kind of an insightful question, right? If you visited your, if you visited your homepage five times in the last month, Google knows that and Google will attempt to say, Hey, th this person has visited this website five times. You know, I should rank this site a little bit higher, giving you kind of a false positive, right? It's like, Oh, wow, I'm ranking really well. Yeah, but someone like me who's never been on your website is not going to get the same search results as you do. So it's not perfect, but if you want sort of that, that clean slate, then just go incognito. Um, there's a few different ways to go to get there on Google Chrome. There's three little dots on the upper right. If you click that, then you can open up a new go a Google incognito window. And I think Microsoft Edge and Firefox and Safari all have something similar. I, I can't remember what they call it. Hopefully that answers the question. Does diluting of duplicate pages work the same if you have one domain that forwards to another? No, not if you've done a proper, what's called a 301 redirect. Um, the, the trouble we will see is people have uh, like, like different domains, but they're still active with the exact same content on each domain, which is, is terrible. And, and it, it's really not a good idea and you will get, uh, you won't rank very well for that. So the way to do that is to make sure if you do have two different domains, just make sure you take the old domain and do what's called a 301 redirect and Google will say, aha, this, this is not duplicate content. It exists here, which is redirected to this, this other site. So hopefully that answers the question. If not, I've got my, I'll have my contact information at the end of this, the uh, webinar. You can reach out to me directly. Perfect. Shall and I continue on Mackenzie? It sounds like you've got one more there. One more question just in regards to uh, blogging and articles. Mm -hmm. If you want to use articles as part of your website content, how do you go about crediting the source? Do you, does using others content detract from your credibility? And does using articles really help your SEO or does original content perform better? Uh, original content performs better. Uh, I would recommend not copying and pasting someone else's article. Uh, even if you do have a citation on the original source, it doesn't help either one of you. Um, the, I think the better approach would be writing your own article and then uh, referencing, you know, here's a, you know, here's a, a, a fantastic article on this exact subject. But if you offer your own insights and a review of the article or something, but don't just take someone else's article and then think that it's okay just to put a, you know, original content found here. So yeah, so don't, don't do that. It's not helpful. Perfect. We have about yeah. seven more questions left, so we'll let you... Yeah, so yeah, we were wrapping things up here. I'm just trying to be mindful of time. We've got, uh, yeah, 10 minutes. So beyond the written word, you've done your keyword research. You've written a fantastic page, just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, tips for you. This may look technical, but it's, it's not. It's, and it's super important. Page titles. Let's talk about that. So you've written a new page about your product or service or your blog, whatever, blog, whatever it happens to be. You're going to give it a title. Here's one. I just pulled at random. Um, yeah, I did, I've done a lot of real estate. I'm not, I'm not thinking about buying or selling my home. So I don't know why I did so many real estate and searches this week. But um, do you see that little tab at the top? Uh, that's what you would see. Like, whatever you see inside that little file folder tab on, on Google or whatever uh, browser you're using, that's the page title. It also appears on the, uh, the organic search results. And I've got it in purple there, Buy, buying and selling home. Perfect. That's a page title. Make sure you have a good one. Make sure you follow Google standards of how long it should be. Metadata. What on earth is that? Well, let's do another search here. So I've, I've got three search results. The, each result has the URL, which is a www. Then it's got the page title that we just talked about. Then it's got this section here, which is called the metadata. So meta literally being the word beyond, like it's, it's beyond the written word. So what, this is your opportunity to entice people when they're looking at 10 other results from 10 other companies. This is your one opportunity to, to encourage them that, hey, this is the page you're looking for, you should click through. So if you do, and, and on whatever platform you're using, WordPress or whatever it is platform you're using, there is a spot for page titles and metadata and those kinds of things. So please put one in. If you don't, it's not the end of the world, um, but Google will go into your page and it'll pluck uh, a, a sentence or two that it thinks 
um, is relevant. I would much rather you have your own information in there than, than relying on what Google thinks, because it is your opportunity to convince people uh, to click on your, onto your site, which is the whole purpose of what we're doing. Alt attributes. No, no webinar would be complete without a, a picture of a cat. Um, so alt attributes pertains to pictures. Now, all it is, it's a description. It's not a caption, but it's like a hidden description. Um, and it's good for a couple of reasons. So how would we caption, not caption this, how, what would the alt attribute be for this picture? Well, this could either be a picture like this could be found on a pet food or not a pet food, rather a, uh, like a, a, a pet store where you buy cats and kittens, or it could be on a, a yarn store that sells fabric and, and yarn. Either way, the, the alt attribute should be the same. Kitten playing with ball of yarn. So this is important for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you ever happen to get someone that's visually impaired on your site, um, the alt attribute um, helps them understand what those photos are. Also, Google's pretty good at interpreting things, but it's not indexing and interpreting images. So if you've got pictures, pictures that pertain to whatever it is you're talking about on your page, this is your opportunity to tell Google, hey, this is a picture of kitten playing with ball of yarn. And, and it, it helps put things into context so Google understands why that picture is there and what it is. And Google likes to see all those blanks filled in. So it's, just, it's good practice, it takes two seconds, do it. Finally, when you're setting up your page, I suggest using headers for, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, this isn't too technical. The, the big hero title is called an H1 header. Uh, again, just think like a newspaper. Um, the, the next kind of subheader is an H2 header. With the H1 header, you've only got one of them. It's just one per page. The H2, you can have multiple. The H3 or the H4, I think it goes all the way to H6. But it does a couple things. It makes it more readable, which is important because you're really trying to impress your audience, right? You're not necessarily trying to impress Google, but you're trying to provide high value for those uh, visitors. So it makes it much easier page to digest. And it sends an, an indication to Google that here are the topics and here are the priorities and here are the things I'm, uh, I'm talking about on this page. So it, it, it really helps Google understand what it is you're trying to, to talk about. So please get in the habit of using those. Next steps. So hurry up and wait. Once you've written a new page, you are not going to rank overnight. In fact, it can be excruciatingly long uh, for you to rank organically. And I kind of apologize in advance. So everything we've talked today is, is we're playing the long game, which maybe I should have talked about in the first two minutes if you've been listening in for an hour now. Um, all this stuff is super important for long-term ranking. It's not going to take immediate effect. Uh, first of all, Google has to come along and index it. Uh, usually that's a matter of days or a, a week or two, something like that. You can also, if you're using um, something called Google Search Console, um, your new pages are automatically uploaded in a sitemap format to, to Google, so it knows to come along and, and crawl. But without getting technical, Google will find your new pages eventually. And that, that doesn't take too long. What takes long is for Google to trust you. Because you've just written a fantastic new article or new page, um, Google is going to take its sweet time on deciding whether or not you're worthy of ranking on uh, page one search results, or better yet, position one, two, and three on page one. And that can be an excruciating wait. It can be six months. It could be 12 months. If you've got a new website, you're a good year away from ranking anywhere near the home page. So you may need to do a stopgap measure like pay-per-click advertising to get some immediate traction, because all this stuff we're talking about today is super important but you probably won't see any positive benefit uh, until you know, early 2021. So I don't want to end off on a bummer here, but um, I did allude to, to videos, which is very much um, considered content. Uh, and I uh, talked about this on a previous webinar, but if you do have videos on your site, which I recommend because people love watching, uh, watching videos about your product, service, informational interviews, whatever it happens to be, you would upload that to YouTube who's owned by Google, and then you would embed what's called, a, you'd, you'd embed that video, it's called an iframe, but you'd embed that video on your landing page. But here's something that almost nobody does that you should consider is transcribing any audio on that. So if there's any sort of dialogue or narration or an interview or any kind of talking on that, if you can transcribe that, that the cheap way is just to transcribe it by hand and just write it out in a Word document, but put that below your video or wherever it's appropriate on your page, 
because Google, even though it has the ability to um, uh, translate or transcribe uh, videos, it's not going to do it on every single video on every single page. So why not just take a few moments, write out whatever it is in the video and stick that underneath the video because it gives Google something to read. And also your visitors too that might not want to watch a video but are interested in reading the, the, uh, the content. But more importantly, it gives Google something to read so it's not just a, you know, a, 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 like what it considers to be an empty video sitting on your, your site. So that, that about wraps it up. Thanks, you've been super patient. Um, I, I've done a couple of these already with the Sandbox, these webinars. The first one was SEO 101 on a SEO on a shoestring budget. This, today's was on content that will help you rank. I've got a few other ideas and I really like your input on, on which direction we should go next. So if you're using the, if you've got that chat feature right in front of you right now, maybe pick one of these that, that resonates with you and let Mackenzie know. Um, or it could be, uh, never invite Daryl back again, he's terrible. But if you're still with us, it tells me that you're interested. So some of my thoughts were more technical, like the next, the, you know, the next step on SEO, things that you can do. Um, could be a Google Ads, like pay-per-click advertising. Uh, one I always enjoy is um, designing web pages, specifically for conversion. And when I say conversion, I mean getting people to do the thing that you want them to do on your website, whether it's downloading a white paper or, or uh, subscribing to a service or doing a, um, you know, submitting a web form or whatever it is that you want them to do. Uh, how do you how do you get people to do those things? Anyways, and how do you what are the, the modern principles of design? And map stack ranking. Do you know when we do a search and you hit enter, you see your, your ads? That next section is that map section of where to find your service in town. So if that's important to you, uh, I could I could do a whole hour on how to rank better on that map stack section. So let let Mackenzie know uh, which one of those you'd like to see next, and I'll be uh, happy to accommodate. Um, Otherwise, if you've got feedback on the quality of this presentation, you know, certainly trying to make these better. Sandbox is, is committed to that. So you can email Mackenzie directly. If you're struggling and you don't know where to start, um, please reach out to me. Um, my email is there. I'd be happy to, to answer any kind of questions. Mackenzie, 1059, we got one minute maybe for one question. No worries. I was just going to say, um, I mean, we'd be happy to, if you have time, Daryl, I'd be happy to stick on here to answer the couple questions that we have. And if people need to get going, they can get going, but I'm not sure about what your day is like either. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, I've, so the presentation is concluded. You're free to go. Thanks so much for joining us. I, I will stick around for uh, five more minutes um, to field any questions that you may have submitted. Perfect. Thanks so much, everybody. If you have to get going, no worries. I hope you have a wonderful day. But we're going to get into some questions here. Um, and we've been seeing some that people are liking the map stack topic. So Oh, good. Good to know. Yeah. Um, and all of the topics. So um, they're thanking you as well, Daryl. So okay. yeah, my pleasure. Um, so First question, what would be a, a best strategy to incorporate on the website to decrease your drop rate? Yeah, so drop rate, I think they're probably referring to like people leaving the website, I would imagine, kind of like a bounce rate. Mm -hmm. um, you have to keep people engaged. You have to answer their questions. Uh, it, it comes down to writing high quality content for the user. Um, so if, if they're detecting a bounce rate, it sounds like a, a, maybe a savvy user is answering this question and, and they may be going on to the Google Analytics and, and seeing that drop off. And if so, if you are using analytics, that's fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. Um, to me, that's the only way you would know if there's drop off. And then the great thing about analytics is you can see what pages are the worst offenders. So if you have a ton of people dropping off of, off of this page, well, that's Google telling you, hey, people aren't liking this page and they're not, it's not resonating with them. Um, the short answer is, is again, high quality, engaging content laid out in a way that you know, people want to see it. Perfect. Is having a blog necessary for e-commerce sites or will keeping products added and updated keep the site fresh for Google? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can give you my thoughts on this. Um, my suggestion would be go and visit your favorite e-commerce sites that are in your industry or, or not in your industry and maybe some, you know, some, some bigger companies. Uh, and see if they have a blog. Uh, to me, that's always a good indication to see what either competitors or other people in other industries that have e-commerce sites, like the, 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 you know, the high quality companies, uh, if they're writing a blog, it's a good indication that maybe you should as well. And, and again, to me, those same principles apply. It, no, it's, the short answer is no, it's, 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 not, you know, it's, it's not critical, but it's, it's not gonna hurt. And 
who knows, by having that blog article on this specific uh, niche subject could just be that point of entry for someone discovering your site and then saying, oh, this is great. I didn't know I could buy this here. So I, I would do it. What do you think of the search engine optimization plugins like Yoast? Yeah, um, eh. <laughs> that would be my one word answer. Uh, Yoast is fine, right? It's a, so for people that don't know, Yoast is included uh, as a WordPress kind of plugin or, or add-on with every WordPress site. And it's, it's an SEO tool. It's not perfect. Like it's, it's very much like SEO for beginners. Uh, so I'll say this. Google does not care what Yoast thinks. So it, it, there's no direct influence that way, but Yoast is good for helping you um, organize your, 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 your sentences and paragraphs. So it's good on a language uh, kind of basis and, and pointing out things that like that, um, like the, the keyword stuffing or you know, those, those kinds of things or maybe style of writing. Uh, so there, there's some good things there, but I just, just take it with a grain of salt and you don't need to be a slave uh, to Yoast. What if most of the service you provide is online driven? How do you promote that with wording? Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's tricky, right? So if your customer base is, is across Ontario or across Canada or across North America, how, you know, how do you get found? And it does help because in um, this is Noreen asking the question and her she's provided her title um, SCC learning education and staffing solutions. So that might help with. You. Yeah. Okay. So for, yeah, for learning and staffing, maybe, I mean, if, if Maureen has like a niche that um, she does staffing for a particular industry, then you don't, the geographic approach isn't going to be as effective as, Hey, we are the experts for, automotive industry staffing and then doing pages related to what, whatever her area of expertise is. It just sounds like her company does have maybe some sort of like vertical market that she prefers to work on. So maybe, maybe her approach there is not geographic because it's not as, as applicable, but maybe if she's got like three or four different vertical markets that she really excels at and does a great job for her and she's well respected in those industries, I would do a page uh, for each industry that she's engaged with. Does the metadata need to include the keywords or can it be more marketing curiosity based questions? Uh, yeah, just don't lay it on too thick uh, with the, the, the keywords. It, it probably should. It, it's, uh, Google doesn't really look at it that way, but um, it's not going to hurt, right? And, and if you've got a keyword in your metadata that happens to match the keyword that that visit or that searcher has typed into the search engine, then to me, uh, well, actually Google will actually go and bold some of those things. With, so it's not, it'll bold those specific words that you're looking for. So yeah, I would, I would do it. Um, just ne not laid on too thick, but then as a, as a searcher, it's like, oh yeah, this metadata has got the exact thing that I was searching for. I'm going to click through to this site. So, so yeah, go ahead. Perfect. And regarding alt attributes, is it true that you should put picture of or image of before the actual description? Oh, I never thought about that. I, I don't have an answer for that. What do I do? Um, no, I, I, I tend not to, kitten playing with yarn. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer. You might look at a, there's a website um, called moz, M-O-Z dot com. I'm sure that they, it's kind of an SEO type of site. So if you go into Moz's site and look for and do a search on their site for alt attributes, they will give you uh, some best practices there. Perfect. If you link your Instagram to your site, so your posts show up there too, does that count as fresh activity on your website? Should you do this in addition to blogging or is, it, is doing one just enough? Yeah, um, doesn't really count. I mean, it, I would say it doesn't count. If I'm mistaken, then it does count. It would be, you know, I remember I talked about those 100 or 200 things that Google is looking at. It would be like number 197 of those 200 things. Uh, so the, the, the ranking signal would be so minuscule as to be uh, like you know, not even, not even uh, factored in, right? So so, so don't do it for that reason. The reason you should do it is if, if it shows that your customers that you're, you're, you're active online and um, 
if it provides any kind of value or any, especially with uh, Instagram, which is very image oriented, if it adds a little bit of color and flair to your homepage, that otherwise might be kind of boring, uh, go ahead and add it, but don't add it for a ranking reason. That, that will be the wrong reason. Even if it did give you a boost, it would just be like minuscule. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And same with blogs. Some people will have like the most recent blog articles on their homepage, like the last three uh, on a rotating, it automatically rotates in. Does Google come along and re-index that page every time that you're rotating your blog? It probably does, but it really, you're only just giving a title or a snippet. So it, it, for an SEO perspective, it, it's, it would be not even worth your while um, unless it provides value to your customers or shows that you're engaged in your industry, then I would do it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And we have one last question here. Um, it seems like this person's had quite a time to rank. Um, his question is, how can I rank my website? I had a website I was supposed to rank. I did everything possible and nothing worked. I drove traffic, traffic from Facebook, Instagram, and even did Google ads, but the ranking never came up. Please advise on how I can rank my website and get results. Thanks. Yeah, there's no magic wand that I can wave. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say this based on that the comment is the, the social signals are important, but there are other more important things like content, which is the, you know, the topic of today's conversation. And uh, Google ads has no bearing. You can spend $10,000 a month and Google will not give you any preferential treatment on your organic rankings. They're, you're clear about that. And you know, we are into Google ads every day, all day. And we, you know, we agree that just because you're spending money with Google, they're not going to change your organic ranking at all. Um, there are so many factors, again, that 200 factors that, that uh, and it can be an excruciatingly long wait, but um, just, you know, fighting the good fight and doing all those things and maybe just starting with that high quality content. Um, but you know, just, you know, sending, sending traffic from Facebook to your, your page isn't going to help. Find out who's ranking well in your industry and see what are they doing? What lessons uh, can you learn from those top three spots? That would be my advice. Awesome. And there's one last question we can sneak in here from sure. Andrew. If you don't mind, um, I have a funnel currently set up that is just grabbing emails for a PDF that is causing the bounce rate to be pretty high. Will that affect the overall site's bounce rate negatively? Negatively, the overall and what number is, it, is what pretty is it? high. He's got right set up. Now. He's collecting. Sorry, Mackenzie. He's collecting email addresses. Yeah, grabbing emails for a PDF. Grabbing e so I'm not sure what grabbing emails for a PDF means. I think maybe it's like signing up for a newsletter or, or something where people will. Perhaps, you know, submit yeah. their, you know, Daryl W at netgainseo.com. Yeah, for a newsletter. So I can said. get a newsletter. Yeah, okay, that so that makes sense. But then they, you know what? A um, couple things. Uh, they may be leaving that page, but they've they've uh, interacted with that page. So Google sees the fact that I made a submission. So I make a submission. So the fact that I I put my name in and hit submit, Google sees that I hit that submit button, even if everyone's leaving from that page. The, the bounce rate is less important than the fact that I engage with that. What I would do, I would have uh, submit my email address, then thank, you know, like a thank you page. Thank you very much. While you're here, here's some neat stuff on other pages that direct, direct them just so, just so you know, they submit it and then there's nothing to do, right? Why don't you entice them to visit some of your other pages or read some of your articles that, that may be related?